22. There's power in the blood. Let's all stand and sing. Page number 23. Would you be free from your burden? bow for prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for this another beautiful day that you've given us, and we thank Amen. you, Lord, that uh, we have the privilege, Lord, and uh, uh, to be in your house, Lord, and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that you'd help us, Lord, through the songs that we've sung, uh, Lord, that uh, you'd help us to see the truths of the Word of God and the doctrines that are uh, ingrained within those songs. And then, Father, help us also, uh, Lord, as we uh, think about... Uh, uh, the things of life, Lord, the problems that we have. Lord, I pray that you'd help us today to put those uh, uh, to the side. 
uh, Lord, that we would uh, place it all in your hands and uh, just, Lord, focus on the, uh, the honor that we have to be in your presence. Father, we just ask your blessings today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate you being here this morning. It's a great blessing to have all of you. And uh, I'll tell you, I don't know uh, if you didn't get the chance to come by yesterday for the uh, Harvest Fest. We had a great, uh, great day yesterday. I don't know how many people we had. We had a lot of folks around here. And uh, the barbecue was great. I don't know if you got any of that. I did get a barbecue sandwich. And uh, it was good. And uh, I enjoyed it. So I hope you enjoyed yours if you got them. If you bought tickets and uh, you didn't come get it, I'm sorry. Uh, we had a lady last year that uh, bought tickets to the, uh, to the main one in uh, the spring and uh, missed the day and came the two days later and wanted to know if she could get her barbecue. I said, it's too late. <laughs> Actually, I think it was a week later. She got it wrong on her calendar, and I said, uh, no, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't have any more. It's gone. Uh, but, uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, appreciate you coming and appreciate you buying a ticket. It's gone. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, anyway, but uh, we had a great time. Uh, everybody that worked the, uh, the booths and all uh, talked about how much fun they had. And it seems like it just gets a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. Uh, I had the privilege of throwing spuns at Brother, Tim, at Brother Tim's face. Uh, un yeah, un unfortunately, I missed twice and uh, just kind of barely caught him on the third one. Uh, thought about buying four more tickets just to, you know, but... Uh, well, Kurt wouldn't get behind there, and uh, so anyway, but we had a great time. I'm sure you did, and uh, we did. Uh, uh, we raised a good bit of money for the school, and so uh, just uh, uh, continue to be in prayer. We've got the Thanksgiving service, our uh, meal coming up for the school on the 22nd. Uh, that's always a great time, and uh, uh, we enjoy uh, that. Getting the parents together is coming. Parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Seems like it just gets a little bigger every year. Uh, we may have to move to the Civic Center downtown uh, to feed everybody <laughs> pretty soon, but uh, it's a fun time. It's great. And uh, so be in prayer for that. Don't forget, uh, things that are happening, it's closing out of the year. Be in prayer about what God would have you do next year. Uh, always about this time, start telling you. You start, need to start setting goals, how much uh, Bible uh, you're going to read through the year, how much uh, time you're going to spend in prayer, how many people you plan on uh, reaching with the gospel of Christ. I'll pull out that list and make a copy of it so you can start setting goals uh, for 2014. I never thought we'd make it to 2014. At least I never thought I would make it to 2014, uh, but uh, it's getting very, very close, and uh, it's hard to believe that 2013 is coming to an end, but uh, quickly it's getting there, and so uh, it's just... So little time, <laughs> but we're going to make it, all right? Again, thank you for being here. Uh, praise service will be a blessing to you.
Turn to page number four. Page number four. <coughs> the way of the cross leads home. Page number four. Let's all stand and see. Sunday morning, we give you an opportunity to return to the Lord a portion of what it is he's given you by way of tithes and offering as you give this morning. Uh, be thankful that you do have to give. Be thankful that the Lord has given uh, this month uh, uh, a number of folks 
uh, on the social medias have uh, decided that we're going to, every day, we're going to write something that we're thankful for. And, uh, you know, some are thankful for houses and thumb, some are thankful for, uh, for jobs and things like that. And those are great things to be thankful for. Uh, but you ought to be thankful, number one, uh, that you have a God in heaven yes, that, uh, that loves you. Number two, you ought to be thankful that uh, that God in heaven reached down his love to you, that you might be saved uh, and be ready and fit for heaven. And, I mean, there's a lot of things that you ought to be thankful for. And this is a time that you do that, reflecting on what it is that God has allowed you to do. The Bible tells us that uh, God loves a cheerful giver. As you give this morning, uh, be thankful that, uh, that God has given that you might give. As we bow for prayer, brother Joey, lead us in prayer, please. Father, we are very grateful to have you as a wonderful, compassionate God that loves everyone. Yes, sir. And, Father, we're, we're so uh, amazed that you would love even us. But, yeah. Father, I don't think we'll ever understand just how much you do love us. Lord, we ask you to please bless this offering. We, we want to serve you the correct way, the Bible way, which is through this church and father we we need to support it financially not just with our presence but but also with uh the tithes and offering that's used to expand what we do here and father we ask you to please help us be obedient in that area and lord would you bless us now through the preaching of your word that's why we're here is to hear your bible taught and may we apply it to ourselves and to our lives so we can be more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
take your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1, 1 Peter chapter number 1, 1 Peter chapter number 1. If you forgot your Bible at home today, there should be a Bible that's right underneath the uh, one of the chairs in front of you. You're welcome to use that and find the book of 1 Peter. I always encourage folks to bring their Bibles. I have been to churches where the preacher preaching didn't even have a Bible. I was kind of shocked about that, but uh, I, I, I was there, <laughs> uh, and uh, I walked in the church, my wife and I, we both had our Bibles in hand, and uh, somebody looked at us and said, um, you're Baptist, aren't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> how did you know? Well, we don't bring our Bibles here, <laughs> going, yeah, that's what's the problem with most churches these days, that uh, we just don't bring our Bibles here, we don't know what the preacher's preaching on, and we can't go back and, uh, and test it out and see if it is true. A number of years ago, uh, a farmer uh, and his family went to church, and a uh, farmer was uh, uh, one of those that was not highly educated. It was back when, uh, when school was not as important as, uh, as they make it out to be these days, and uh, of course the the uneducated were more educated than most of our educated are today. Uh, don't ask me to repeat that, but it's true. Uh, we send our kids to uh, uh, 13 years of uh, uh, education from K-4 or K-5 through 12th grade. Then we send them on to another four years, hopefully, of uh, college. And then uh, if they go on beyond that, and, uh, and, truth, and the truth is a lot of them have absolutely no idea what it is they're supposed to know. And uh, so uh, uh, anyway, but uh, this man, he uh, didn't, hadn't, didn't learn to read. And uh, they went to church, and the preacher was preaching on tithing that morning. And uh, they got home and sat down. Mama was uh, getting the uh, uh, food uncovered off the table. Remember that? You're old enough to remember when Mama just covered the table, put all, left the food on the table, covered it up, and you uncovered it, heated it up, and ate it. We don't do that kind of stuff anymore, uh, but I used to like it when Mama did that. Uh, anyway, uh, Mama was getting ready for, for lunch, and Papa was sitting on the porch with the kids, and Mama hollered, it's time for lunch. And uh, Daddy said, now, before y'all go anywhere, son, go get, go get the Bible. And he came back. He said, now, find that place where the preacher was, preach preacher was preaching at this morning. He opened it up to the text, and he read it. Uh, to his dad, he said, uh, he said, well, that's what the Bible says. We'll start that next Sunday morning and close the Bible and went to eat lunch. Now, you know, that's, that's true belief. What does the Bible say? If the Bible says it, we ought to do it. I've seen those bumper stickers says, you know, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, God said it, that settles it. <laughs> you can leave the middle person out of it. Uh, whether you believe it or not, God still said it. Uh, by now, you have found 1 Peter chapter number 1. Uh, I'll take that as, uh, as a yes. If you would, please stand with me in the reverence to the reading of the Word of God. We're going to read three verses this morning. Uh, 
uh, for our text, speaking to you on the subject, begotten of the Father, begotten of the Father. First Peter chapter number 1 began reading in verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, received in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I call your attention back to verse number three, and that phrase, begotten us again unto a lively hope. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you again this morning, we thank you again for the privilege it is to be in your house. Lord, I know that across this, uh, across this world and many countries, the, uh, the Christians who have true faith in Christ are, are meeting in, uh, uh, in secret. There's uh, dangers of, uh, of uh, being uh, accosted and persecuted for their faith in Christ. And Father, we thank you that we still in America have that freedom uh, to worship and worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, Father, that we would not take that uh, freedom lightly, but, Lord, that as we would come together this morning, that we'd open our hearts, we'd open our minds. Father, we'd put away from us the, uh, the cares and the problems of this life and, uh, Lord, focus upon the truth of the Word of God. And, Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. I pray especially, Lord, that you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit and with power, uh, that you'd have me say exactly what you want me to say, nothing that you don't want me to say. And, Lord, we'll give you the thanks, the praise, the honor, and the glory in the precious holy name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. As we begin the message this morning, we study in the last two messages, uh, chapter uh, 1, verses 1 and 2. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, we find that Peter is writing uh, to the strangers that are scattered abroad. And we talked about those strangers, uh, probably believers that are scattered, whether Jews or Gentiles. It doesn't matter, but they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul, uh, Peter reminds them that uh, their, uh, their salvation is dependent upon the triune God. It is God who foreordained before the foundations of the world that you and I might be saved. It is God who came with the plan of salvation before the foundations of the world, before he placed uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, and uh, the planets in place, before he, he uh, created uh, the sun, the, uh, the, the waters, and divided them, and all of these things that God did in the creation of the universe, all of that, before God sat down and did any of that, he had the plan of salvation set down. You need to understand that. And so it was God. Uh, it is God's plan. It is not my plan. And the reason that I dwell upon that is because there's a lot of folks out there that believe that, well, I'm saved, but I'm saved, and I've got to keep it. There's nowhere in the Bible does it say that you've got to keep it. It doesn't say that. You say, well, that's what I was taught. Well, you find it in the Bible, like the man about tithing, and you bring it to me and you show it to me, I will guarantee you it's nowhere there to be found that you have to keep it. Now, I know there's a few verses out there that folks like to take out of context, like Acts chapter 2, where you've got to save yourself from this untoward generation. <laughs> it's not what he's talking about. And what we find over there, well, you've got, to, you, uh, you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It, totally out of context, not what he's talking about. Now, our salvation is totally dependent upon God. Yes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says that God foreordained it before the foundation of the world. And so it is in God. Then the Holy Spirit of God works uh, within the hearts of man and brings them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the use of conviction, through the use of uh, other means that the Holy Spirit works with us and brings us to the plan or to the place of salvation. I remember so vividly the day that I got saved, how that the Holy Spirit of God worked in my heart and in my life. I've been going to church for probably about uh, six to eight months by myself. My parents didn't go to church. My brothers didn't go to church. Uh, I walked to church. Now, I didn't walk to church three miles in the snow, uphill both ways. Uh, I didn't do any of that. 
but I did walk to church that uh, every Sunday morning, and I went to church that particular Sunday morning, that, uh, uh, and I uh, was, had gone to Sunday school. I was planning on going to Sunday school and leaving. My dad was supposed to pick me up, and uh, uh, we were going to do something that afternoon. I don't remember what it was, but he was going to pick me up and uh, bring me home, but he, he, he failed to do so. But after I left Sunday school that morning, the Holy Spirit of God spoke to my heart as I got uh, just a little way from the church to the stop sign at the corner, and uh, the Holy Spirit of God said, go back in. Now, he didn't speak to me audibly. I didn't hear a voice, okay? Now, some folks say they heard God. Now, I heard God, but it wasn't audibly, all right? Now, the, the Holy Spirit of God in my heart said, you need to go back in there. And I said, but my dad's coming. <laughs> if he shows up and I'm not here, he's going to be very angry with me. The Holy Spirit of God says, it's okay. Do what I tell you. And I went back into that church, and I sat down on this side over here, about middle ways back, and the preacher preached and, uh, and gave an invitation and uh, uh, asked for us that were unsaved to come forward. And the Holy Spirit of God says, you need to go. And I went to the old-fashioned altar that morning, knelt down, cried out to God. He forgave my sin. I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. Now, let me tell you something right here, folks. The Holy Spirit of God had a work in my salvation. Interesting enough, when he said, hey, it's taken care of, my dad forgot to come get me. Story of my life. <laughs> but my dad forgot to come, and I still had to walk home. Three miles, uphill, both ways. Folks, the Holy Spirit of God works in salvation. He calls us to salvation. He convicts us of our sin. He, he deals with us according to the need that we have and in different ways for different people. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit of, of God has the work in salvation. Second, or thirdly, the Lord Jesus Christ has the work in salvation. It tells us that he died on the cross of Calvary. Oh, what a Savior. <laughs> oh, what a Savior. You see, he came from the heaven's portals. He came from the glories of heaven. He came to this earth uh, through a virgin's womb, and he lived in this life uh, for 33 and a half years, uh, uh, sinless and spotless and stainless. Uh, he did nothing but good for uh, uh, 33 and a half years, and he willingly went to the cross. Amen. They said, we take your life from you. He goes, no, I lay my life down. I lay my life down. He gave his life that you and I might be saved. The work of salvation is in the Father and in the Spirit and in the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this and as we continue further uh, into our study of 1 Peter, notice what he says in verse number 3. May I read it to you again? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a, uh, the lively hope uh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, there's several things I want you to see, first of all. Number one, he said, blessed. If you go back uh, every Friday evening in RU, uh, we say Psalm 1. Uh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sinneth. And we go through that psalm all the way through every Friday night. One of these days, I'm going to memorize it, Brother Joey. But it's there. Every week we say the same thing over and over and over again. But that word blessed there means happy is the man. Now, this word blessed here means praise. <laughs> praise God. It's blessed be the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice this, which according to his abundant mercy... Number one, I want you to know that salvation is because of the abundant mercy of God. Amen. It is the abundant mercy of God. Now, that word abundant means a lot. <laughs> I mean, when you stop and you consider, I mean, what, what do you consider an abundance of money? Okay? I mean, people, uh, you know, uh, in, our, in our society today, they think, well, if I get a million dollars amassed in my lifetime, that's an abundance of money, and I can live on that. Do you know that most people that win the lottery and get a million dollars waste it within a few months and have nothing to show for it? You know that? You see, an abundance of money. If you had $20 billion, I guarantee you, you'd want $25 billion. 
It, it is never enough. You say, well, that's an, an abundance. No, you won't live on that. You won't stay within that. You won't uh, uh, work within the confines of that money. You say, well, that's an abundance. No, let me tell you something. When you're talking about the abundance of mercy, it is the mercy of God that spans all of creation. It, it spans everything. When, when you, uh, the songwriter that wrote uh, that if, uh, if the heaven were a scroll and, and, and every uh, 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 ocean were, uh, were a quill or uh, were the well, the ink well, and, uh, and every feather or every stalk were a quill, and you could write across there the love of God, you, you would run the ro oceans dry to go beyond the, the mercy uh, of God or the love of God. It's interesting to note because there's a principle in the Bible called the law of first mention. And let me go take you back uh, to Genesis chapter number 19, if you will. Go back to Genesis chapter number 19. The law of first mention. Now, the, the, the first time the word mercy is mentioned in the Bible is mentioned in Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 19. Now, let me kind of uh, uh, outline this because I don't have time to go through the entire chapter, but I, I just want you to notice something here. This is the story of Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Uh, Abraham's nephew, Lot, had chosen him the well-watered uh, uh, plains of Jordan. When, when he and, and the uh, Abraham's uh, herdsmen couldn't get along, and uh, the men couldn't get along, the servants couldn't get along, Abraham said, let's not, start, let's not start here having a fight and a division. You choose where you go, and I'll go the opposite direction. And so uh, uh, Lot looked out, and the Bible says he pitched his tent toward Sodom. In other words, he pitched his tent towards a place that he knew the sin and the wickedness and the depravity of that city. He knew that. Not only did he pitch his tent there, but he took his family to the place of knowing uh, of, of the sin and this wickedness and this depravity. He, he, he moved his family to the place. Folks, if I, if I could just say here as an aside, when you t intentionally put your family in a place where you know that there's wickedness and sin and depravity and, and perversion, when you do that, you can just mark it down, you're going to lose your family. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. He got to looking at the great things. He got to looking at the beauty uh, of the, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the watered plains of Jordan. Oh, look at what it offers here. Look what, is, what great it, this is here. I mean, we can, we can really live it up there. Peter tells us in, chapter, uh, in 2 Peter, chapter number 2, that just Lot was vexed with a filthy conversation of the, of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, this is the place. It, 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 it is called Sodom because of the wickedness of the sin of sodomy, homosexuality. And God told Abraham, I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy those cities. And Abraham had a, a conversation, a prayer with God and said, God, if there was 50 righteous, if there's 45 righteous, uh, let me go down all the way down to 10 righteous. Because Abraham had, had pled with God and he thought, you know, I know Lot. I've trained him. He's been in my house. He knows the, uh, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He knows the things of God. And maybe he's gotten over there and at least he's led his family to the Lord. Lot was so vexed with the filthy conversation and placed himself in the political standards of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that he lost his family. You see, but you notice in chapter 19, as the angels of God are leading Lot and his wife and his two daughters that were still at home out of the city, notice what it says, and behold now, Thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy. That word mercy, I, 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 in my master's program, I had to do a, a word study on the, on the word mercy in the Bible. And that word, uh, the Hebrew word is kased, and it means loving kindness. 
It means mercy. It means kindness. It means uh, favor. This is the loving kindness of God, that he would take a, a child of God who was in, involved in the wickedness and the sins uh, of the community in which he lived and making the laws and, and uh, upholding maybe the, uh, the standards uh, of that community uh, in the gate of the city. And God said, Lot, <laughs> I'm pulling you out. You're, you're, this city is going to be destroyed. You need to get out of here. You need to go tell your, your daughters and your sons-in-laws. You need to go and bring them out. You need to tell them that I'm fixed to destroy. And he seemed as one who that mocked to his children. But in the mercy of God, God reached down and brought him out. It's the same thing if you go, Moses found grace, or Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Because he was a righteous man. And so when all of the world was destroyed with, an, with the antediluvian flood, when God destroyed this world with, with, the, with water, the flood, uh, that totally uh, destroyed this earth in the way that, that and the animal life and the plant life, God reached down and pulled Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives out. That tells us something here. That tells us that the mercy of God is still in effect. That God is not willing that, that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That God is showing his mercy to us, we're not willing that we should perish. This, this wickedness in this world that we live in today, I mean, I could not even imagine the perversions and the problems in our society today would be manifest the way they are. When I got saved in 1972, but in that short 40 plus years, I've seen our country go from bad to worse. I remember having conversations with my friends uh, that, are, that were saved. We said, you know, if, if this old world makes it to, to 1975, we're going to be doing good. I think the rapture is going to take place by 1975 because we were talking about some wicked stuff that was happening in society. And then we said, well, if it happens, you know, by 1980... <laughs> I mean, there's things happening on TV now that, uh, I mean, that, that, that would make uh, uh, Lucy and Desi blush. Do you remember watching the Lucy, uh, I Love Lucy show? They had separate beds. They didn't even put them in the same bed. Towards the end, they pushed the beds together, but they were still separate beds. I mean, and <laughs> look what we have today. I mean, the wickedness and the sin. And we said, it is the abundant mercy of God that we're not destroyed. In fact, the Bible tells us that his mercies are new every day. You ought to be thankful and you ought to praise God that the mercies of God are new every day, especially in your life and in my life. Because I don't, you know, I'm standing up here and I'm, I'm preaching, but I'll tell you what, I struggle with the same temptations, the same problems, the same things you do. And I'm telling you, I am so thankful that I have a merciful, gracious God. And so it's his abundant mercy. But look at this also in verse number 3 again. Uh, he, notice, uh, let me get back there. Notice it again when he says it's, uh, the abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. It is the mercy of God that's begotten us again. Now we look at that word begotten and it's only used twice in this form in the New Testament. You say, well, wait a minute, what about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, different word. <laughs> in fact, if you, he, he, the two times he used it in 1 first, in, in first Peter is found here. Look at chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again. Same word. Begotten. <laughs> Being born again. What did, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus in Nicodemus chapter number 3? Ye must be born again. You must be begotten of the water and of the Spirit. You, you, you have to have a new birth. You have to be born again. And the Bible says that God has birthed us again into the family of God. We've been adopted, according to Romans chapter 8, uh, into the family of God. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. The only way you're going to do that is through the new birth of Jesus Christ. 
You see, he has begotten us again unto a lively hope. That's a living hope. That's not dead. That's alive. If you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter number 6 and, and you follow along through verses 1 through 11, you'll find that we, have been, we, have been, uh, we are dead to our trespasses and sin. We're dead. That's what it said. I mean, to, to be dead is to be dead. This, this, this banister right here is dead. I can walk over here and I tell that banister, come, come follow me. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't going nowhere unless I get a hammer and and destruct it and, and move it with me. I've had, I've had funerals, and I've had the casket in front of me, and the person that's in that casket is dead, D-E-A-D, -E dead. You touch their body, it's cold. There's no life there. And I can, I can go to that, ca that, that, that casket, and I can look at that person, and I can call them by name, and I say, you come up out of there. It, it has lost the ability to move. It is dead. And the Bible tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. In other words, we need to understand something, folks. We are dead in Christ. In fact, in Romans, uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The problem in our spiritual lives is that we have not crucified the flesh. We, we have decided, I'm going to hang on to that. I like what I do. I like where I go. I like what I, but I want to go to heaven too. What most people have is fire insurance but they don't have a relationship. All I, want, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to, by faith, receive Jesus Christ, but I don't want to do anything. Baptists are number one that's, that's being criticized for eternal security of the believer because everybody says, well, you know what they, those Baptists believe. Yeah, I know what they believe. Once saved, always saved. You can do anything, live any way you want to, and, 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 and go to heaven. <laughs> no. I believe in the eternal security of the believer that when you by faith receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life and the Holy Spirit of God has done the, uh, the work of salvation in your heart, uh, you're saved, you're going to heaven. But I guarantee you, your want to is going to change. Amen. The places you go are going to change. Amen. What you're watching on TV is going to change. What you keep in your refrigerator is going to change. You see... When I got saved, God did a work in my heart. Something changed within my life. I got rid of the cigarettes, and I got rid of the vocabulary, and I got rid of the magazines, and I got rid of all that filth uh, out of my life because uh, I'm now saved. I'm a child of the King. I am on my way to heaven. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But folks, what I want you to understand is salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And once you're saved, you're going to heaven. Now, you have a lovely hope. You have a living hope. Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And if you've got a Savior that never came out of the grave, you have nothing. That's why they made, took such pains on the, on the day that Jesus came forth out of that grave to come, come forth with a lie. They stole him. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he was seen of over 500 people. That's a pretty good witness. How many of you witnessed my accident on Garth Road this week? Any of you? None of you? My wife and my son are the only two that witnessed that. Of all the 40 million people that go up and down Garth Road every day, three of us have witnessed the accident that I was in. I'm lucky to be alive. <laughs> Just, kidding. Just kidding. A little, a little thin of bitter, nothing, nothing major. Now, if the police had shown up there, he would want witnesses. Who did what? <laughs> Well, the back end of my truck is the evidence of somebody didn't stop. But the truth is, it was my word to his word. You see, if you've got witnesses, you've got a better sure word. And we've got over 500 witnesses. Testified under oath. <laughs> Hey, he came forth out of that grave. Let me tell you something. If you've got a Savior that's still in the grave like Muhammad and like Confucius 
like Mao Zedong and a few of those others that claim, like David Koresh and a few of the others that claim to be the Messiah and they're still in the grave, you ain't got nothing. My Savior came forth out of the grave and that tomb is empty. And so he says we were risen to a lively hope. If you look at that, notice what he says now. This, this, this is so good. This is so good. You, you, you ought to look at this. Number one, we have, we have life. Eternal life. When I, when I do a funeral for somebody who is saved, I mean, I go to the cemetery and I say, look, this ain't it. This is just the tabernacle. This is just the body. This is just the vessel that God used, but this vessel is going to be planted in, this, in the cemetery, and as it's planted in this cemetery, one of these days, hey, according to the word of God, the Bible says that the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hey, you don't stand here at this grave and mourn and weep over the person that's gone because they ain't here. They're going to left out. You see, you need to understand that. But notice this. We have an inheritance. Notice. Verse number four. To an inheritance incorruptible. You realize that you were born dying? I look around, I see a bunch of people with glasses on. Those old eyes aren't like they used to be, are they? <laughs> Some of you even got little lines on them. Some of you got two and three little lines underneath there. Some of you are vain like me and wear contacts. Some of you got teeth that come out like stars at night. Some of you have comb overs. Some of you quit combing over. You have nothing to comb. Why is that? Because this body is corruptible. It's corruptible. But if I ask for a show of hands, how many of you are on blood pressure medicine? I, I guarantee you, a lot of us are. <laughs> how many of us are on diabetic medicine, uh, metformin or uh, glucophage, something like that? A, a, a lot of us would raise our hands. How many of you have joint pain and arthritis? Most of us would raise our hands. Why is that? Because this is a corruptible body. Take your Bibles. This is too good to be true. Just take your Bibles to, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'm going to find it here sooner or later. I think it's in the Bible. I think I even have it marked. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'm going to pick up reading here in the Bible, verse number 51. First Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corruptible. Amen. You know why the dead are in the grave? Six foot under in a vault <laughs> because they stink. They're corrupted. Their, their body is gone. The, all that's there is, is dust. From ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You heard the saying before? God told Adam, <laughs> you're going to be ashes again one of these days? Job said, when, the, when my skin worms destroy this body, corruptible but they're going to put on incorruption. Notice this. And we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption. The mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible shall put on incorruption and the mortal shall put on immortality, then shall come, be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I want you to understand something here. You see, you, you stand there and, and, and you look at that grave. I have a grave plot. It's out there on, the, on 146 in Palm Cemetery. It's right underneath a beautiful oak tree. 
And Lord Terry is coming, and I and I and I make it to that to that place, to that plot, and they dig it up, and they put my body in a casket, and they lower it down into that vault, and they put that top uh, on there, and they and they put the sod back on it, and then in, in a few weeks it's going to look like it was never even touched. Hopefully somebody will put a headstone there. Here lies the body of Jim Lamb. Great guy, handsome, good looking, you know, whatever you want to put on there. Just put the truth on it. That's all I ask. All right. Born June 10th, died whatever date it was. But you don't sit there on the grave and look at that headstone and say, man, he's a good guy. Handsome, debonair, all those fun things. Because I'm coming out of there one of these days. And I'll tell you what's going to happen on one of those days. When that trumpet sounds, I hope, I hope I have just enough time to turn around with my size eight foot and kick that, foot st- that headstone and kick it over and say, Devil, you thought you had me. <laughs> you didn't have me. You see, because I ain't there. Incorruptible. And my inheritance is incorruptible. That's what he says. Notice that, secondly, it's undefiled. Notice, if you will, in, the, in that text. Notice what he says. He said that uh, uh, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, unpolluted. No defile to it. You see, there's some things that are going to be destroyed. Even gold, the Bible says, useless but I have something that God has given me that's better than gold an inheritance that's incorruptible undefiled notice what he says again fadeth not away (laughs) it's never going away it's there I remember I have pictures (laughs) I have pictures of Kurt too (laughs) I have some pictures that I don't want anybody in the world to see. Brother Tim felt sorry and posted one of himself so that he'd make Brother Kirk feel good. I have pictures that I don't want anybody to see. But in some of those pictures, I'm like this big around. And I've got brown hair, literally brown hair. I mean, no gray in it at all. But you see, as as I've aged... (laughs) I've put on a couple of pounds, and my eyesight's fading, and my hearing's fading, huh? And my hair is fading. Not only is it fading, it's turning loose. You see, my inheritance in heaven is never going to fade away. It's there. It's always there. In fact, (laughs) I like to think about this. Heaven, streets of of gold, gates of pearl. I mean, crystal river running through the center of it. Tree of life bearing 12 banners of fruit. I mean, looking at this beautiful city, and I'm thinking, I'm going to get there one of these days. I'm going to be there one of these days. That's my home. Bible tells me, in my Bible, if you have a, one of those weak Bibles, it might tell you that it, it, it's, a, it's a, a dwelling place, an apartment house. It's a mansion. He says, let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. And I can, I can just vision that mansion. I drive down Shoreline every once in a while. I drive down through River Oaks once in a while, and and I look at these massive houses these people live in and paying massive amounts of of, uh, house payments and and taxes and all those things, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to live in one of those one of these days, (laughs) and it don't cost me a dime. I mean, there, there is no mortgage payment. And there's no taxation. (laughs) 
because my representative says it's free. <laughs> Think about it. You see, it fadeth not away. And it's got a reserve sign on it. <laughs> it's what it says. Reserved in heaven for me, for you. When you stop and you think about it, your mansion has a reserve sign on it, and, and I like it this way. Back a few months ago, well, back in August, we took Michael to a nice fancy restaurant. I made reservations for us to go and eat, and they reserved us a table. You know, there were other people in the restaurant, but they didn't sit them at that table. You know why? Because it was reserved for me. Sometimes I travel and I call ahead and I say, I, I, I need a room at the Hampton Inn. Because that's usually where I stay at the Hampton Inn, because you can pretty well guarantee no bed bugs, comfortable pillows, nice sheets. Hampton Inn. I, I call ahead and I said, I need, I need a room for this night. They give me a confirmation number and I get there and it's reserved in my name. <laughs> Folks, I got saved 41 years ago. And I haven't shown up and I haven't seen my mansion, but I know it's got my name on it. <laughs> it's reserved for me. And if you're saved, you've got a mansion there that's reserved for you, and it's got all, I mean, th this is my pea brain, but it's got all your favorite things there. No football, no NASCAR, sorry. <laughs> Sad to throw that in. But I think my refrigerator is going to be filled with cherry pies, bluebell ice cream, promised land chocolate milk, because nobody has milk like promised land. I mean, it, 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 it's going to have it's going to have my favorite soap. My, I don't even know you need to take a bath anymore. But I mean, it's going to have everything I want there. It's going to be there for me, because it's reserved for me. And by the way, my father knows what I like. <laughs> he knows what I have need of, and he's placed it already in my mansion. It's reserved. Hey, let me let me give you the last one here. This one ought to make you shout. Notice verse number five, who are kept by the power of God. <laughs> kept by the power of God. Preserved by the power of God. That, that word power there is dunamis, and, and it means authority. And you know who has the, the greatest authority in the entire universe? That's God himself. And it says right here that I'm kept by the authority of God. Authority. You see, that's the same authority that he gives to you and me in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall be witnesses unto me. Hey, he said, I, I, all power is given unto me, he says. And then he says, I give it to you. You see, we have that power, that authority. And I am kept by the authority of God. But one of the greatest things, if you will, turn back to the book of Ephesians. This, this, is, this is just too good. You've got to look at this. I know my time is gone. You should, you should have turned the, you probably didn't set the clock on your stove anyway. And you probably already, you, you roasted and close to being done. But look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. How many of you really set your clocks back and just woke up at the regular time? Yeah. Hoping that you're, Cell phone company would do that. <laughs> Verse 13. In whom you also trusted after you heard <laughs> the word of, the tr of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, the seal, the king's seal, was put there as his approval. In, De in Daniel chapter number 3, they put a seal on the, on, on the decree that you had to bow down and worship the golden image. But there's three guys there that said, I don't care what the seal says. I'm not paying attention to that. 
They went through the fire, came out on the other side. Daniel chapter number 6, they put a seal on the decree that you couldn't pray to any other god. Daniel says, I'm not, I'm not paying attention to that. Went to his house, opened his window towards Jerusalem as always, and knelt down and prayed. Well, you know, this is the law that was sealed by the law of the Medes and the Persians. It can't be changed. <laughs> hey, God's greater than the law of the Medes and the Persians. And it says right here that after I believed, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, that seal, that, that means I'm done. <laughs> I've got the royal seal of God in my life. I'm going to heaven one of these days. And it was sealed in blood of Jesus Christ. But don't stop there. Notice this. Let's go back there. In whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. That word earnest there is like earnest money. I bought a house back here at Highlands Ranch, and, uh, and they said, now we need some <laughs> earnest money. And I said, how much? They said $1,000. Now if you go through with the deal, we'll put that to your, to your account. But if you back out, it's our money, earnest money. That means that they can't sell my house to anybody else unless I back out. And they get my money and somebody else's money. Now, folks, the Holy Spirit of God sealed us into the day of redemption, which is the earnest of the redemption price. You see, the earnest money has already been put down on my soul. And now I'm waiting for the redemption of my soul. The final part of my salvation, I'm still waiting for it. And, and, and God says, just hang on there. Just hold on. It's taken care of. We're just waiting until you take possession. See, my mansion already has the earnest money laid down on it. I'm already taken care of. I can go back to the, to the day, first day of the contract on August the 20th of 1972. The contract was signed then with my Savior. For you, it may be some other date, but for me, it was August the 20th of 1972 when, when my salvation was sealed and secured in Jesus Christ. Now, it says in, in here in our text, notice what he says, we are kept. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto, the sal unto salvation ready to re be revealed at the last time. The last time. When is that? <laughs> I don't know the day nor the hour. I don't know if I'll go through death or if I'll go through the rapture, but I do know I'm getting into heaven one day. And it's signed, sealed, and delivered. I'm just waiting. And, you, and what did we say at the beginning? It's God that did it. I trusted in faith that he'd do it. And by the way, God can't lie. If you, don't, if you believe God can lie, read Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. <laughs> he can't lie. It says he can't lie. He's faithful. So what does that tell us? If we're unsaved, it means you need to get ready. Because you don't know the day nor the hour that you're going to die or that the rapture is going to take place and starts the, uh, the most horrendous judgment upon this earth that the world has ever known. You thought 9-11 was bad? You thought the Holocaust was bad? You thought the tsunami, tsunamis back in March uh, last year were bad over Japan? You ain't seen nothing yet. You ought to be ready for the, for the upper taker and not the undertaker. You ought to be ready to, uh, for when, when the trumpet sounds that you're going to go with him. You say, well, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> you give me the date. You give me the time of your death, your departure from this life. You can't do that. So you don't have plenty of time. Because your number could be called 
immediately today. For those of us that are saved, we're, and, we're, and we're playing around with our salvation, it ought to get us serious about what God's done for us. And saying, God, if you've done that for me, I'm going to do my best for you. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm doing the best I can. But I've got loved ones that are unsaved. You ought to be diligent to take them to this passage and say, look what God's done for you. He's given you everything, incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. God's got this ready for you. Why don't you get it ready for them? Get it ready for yourselves. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your grace. Praying, Father, that your will will be accomplished in the hearts and lives of your people today. Lord, speak to our hearts through the word this morning. If there's somebody here that's unsaved, if they, if they don't know 100% sure for a Bible reason, they have a home in heaven, Lord, I pray that they'd come to know Christ today as Savior and Lord of their life. And they would gain the privileges of, of sainthood by the promises of the word of God. Then, Father, I pray for those that are saved that, Lord, we would uh, surrender ourselves and submit ourselves, Lord, to your will and your direction in our hearts and our lives. Father, for those that have unsaved loved ones and friends and neighbors, Lord, like myself, Lord, that we'd be more diligent to share the gospel to this lost and dying world. Bless the invitation is our prayer. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, no one looking around, the pianist begins to play. God speaks to your heart, you come.